All right, guys, let's get started. It's lecture number four in the Data Science for Business course. Um, today, we're going to talk about classification models, about churn prediction, and in general, a little bit about customer relationship management or like CRM systems. So <clears throat> we're going to start with the business side of things um, and talk about CRMs first. Um, CRM, in general, its approach to managing uh, companies' interaction with current and potential customers um, to improve the relationship with business, um, focusing on, uh, of course, customer retention and increasing sales. And uh, again, it's all again, like like we, we said before, it's all about costs or revenues. Here, this is really about revenues. Yes. And uh, you know, within the company, it's usually marketing department, sales, uh, well, sometimes the customer service support that deals with CRM. And there are CRM systems that most of the companies, uh, especially consumer companies, uh, real retail, do have. And they operate with, you know, emails, with calls, with, you know, all kind of follow-ups um, with customers, but also very, very important to actually not, uh, not only to acquire customers, but to keep the customers and um, prevent them from leaving. Now, um, in particularly, um, the CRM systems are important for service sector where um, the, the companies produce services, or professional services instead of um, end products. And um, the example, of course, will be you know, telecommunication, it's health services, it's education, it is financial services or banking, insurance, investment. It is various professional services like accounting, legal, consulting, but it's all, you can think about also transportation, media, real estate, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so things where um, services where you know the, the, the ultimate goal is to provide service and not just to sell a product. It's it's about selling services. Now, um, uh, the 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 reason we're focusing on them right now and talking about customer relationship management is because within the service sector, um, again, it's it, the, the customer acquisition can be quite expensive. Um, and in fact, um, especially in the services where, uh, where, where market is saturated. And um, you know, great example is you know, tele telecom and financial sectors, right? Um, and in fact, telecom is probably you know, one, of, one of the most sort of interesting sectors for us to, to, to study. Now, for all of those sectors, losing customers is expensive because um, you know, acquiring them is expensive, and for many in many cases, um, customer will use only one service at a time. So, well, in banking, you know, may, you might have maybe several accounts in several banks, uh, but let's say if uh, you're you know, if 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 you're thinking about telecom, mobile phone companies, right? You know, it's it's quite rare. Uh, for a customer to have several phone numbers and especially having them at, at different um, operators, right? Even if you have a, uh, two phone numbers, you most likely will have it at the same operator. So for telecom, losing, cu losing customers is bad and um, market is saturated. So pretty much everybody has a phone. And so the only way to gain new customer is the customer uh, leaves your competitor, right? And so um, trying to keep the customers and actually predict if the customer is going to leave, that can be an interesting and important question for uh, CRM um, and especially at telecoms. And this is a problem that we're going to focus on today. Um, the model we're going to look into will be churn management model. Um, now, before we go to churn, um, let's just sort of in general discuss um, you know, any type of propensity modeling. So propensity modeling is a, is, is, um, a model that tries to predict propensity or probability, um, likelihood, um, and it's in general terms, right? Not mathematical definition. Um, 
to buy a particular service or product, a readiness for customers to buy a new service or a new, to buy a new product. Um, it's a readiness of a customer to respond to an offer because sending an offer to a customer that is not ready to respond to it, well, it's wasting um, you know, company money and pissing off customer, right? Upsetting customer. And um, propensity to churn, it's a likelihood that the customer is going to leave your service and, and you know, most likely going to competitor. Um, that's actually probably one of the most important among those propensity models. And the idea is that if we can take all the customers and then we can, for example, uh, whatever model we build, we can you know, divide customers into groups, um, for example, with sort of low, medium and high propensity for particular action, right? For a new product or respond, offer response or churn, then we can focus um, efforts, marketing efforts um, on those um, that uh, we believe more likely to you know, respond to those offers and thus not wasting time and not wasting energy and money um, on the customers who are not um, interested or those who do not want to, to churn out, but we, we also will give them a discount that we should, shouldn't have to, right? Okay. Excuse me. Um, so, you know, the idea is to, for example, either um, split customers into buckets and for different with a, with, with a different response rates, potential different response rate, um, or um, maybe you know rank all the customers pretty much assign a particular rank, say probability of a churn for a customer. And then you know sort them by this probability, and then decide on action depending on certain threshold. Um, in any case, if we actually do say buckets, and uh, that's very very typical um, in, in in business, it's still usually not very. It's still not personal. It's still kind of bucket based. Um, then you can actually build a model. And uh, you can evaluate the efficiency of this model by using so-called response, um, but by using a leaf chart, right? And uh, leaf chart, and we're going to talk about um, how to build those charts or how to build those graphs. But the idea of a leaf chart is to show you how many, how much more efficient you are um, within the particular bucket. So if we look at this, um, at this picture. Oh, great, and now I can annotate. If we look at this picture, for example, um, it's, uh, it shows us a different percentile of, um, of customers, right? And the first 10% uh, of customers. And if we do a good job at predicting the likelihood of the response, the propensity, you know, we'll get <clears throat> a stronger effect um, versus, um, you know, if we get sort of, if we go for the next 20, percent the effect will be less and if we go for the next 40 percent the effect will be less and of course if we go to 100 percent the effect will be the same as you know and then it doesn't matter if we cover all the all the customers it, it doesn't make any sense to bucket them um all right so that's just sort of overall um you no know, approach and ideas for the propensity modeling um what we're going to do now is we're going to switch um and talk more about classification, right? With, with the concept that, look, let's say we can classify customers into these buckets, either you know various sort of high, low, medium propensity to 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 respond to an offer, or um, we'll talk about say binary classification for customers who we expect to churn or not churn. So we talk about um, the math and and uh, machine learning algorithms. And then we'll consider an example uh, for the churn prediction. So, um, as we have previously discussed, I think in the first or second lecture, um, classification algorithms really means uh, partitioning um, the data points, partitioning um, the, the items into um, different buckets. And we can think about binary classification, which means partitioning is splitting into two parts, or it's going to be multi-class classification where there are multiple 
um, classes. And um, you can think about class assignments um, where it is sort of a binary class assignment, which where, where you either belong to one class or not, or you can think about probability belonging to a class. And there are situations where classification is easy, well, relatively easy, and there are situations where it's it's not um, trivial, and uh, you know you need to select certain type of models. For example, if we look on on the left hand side here, um, then um, you notice um, this you know two dimensional data set where every point has two parameters, two variables, two attributes. Um, and these are allocated such a way that they're so-called linear separable. So we can actually draw a line, right? Sure. This, this line that separates them nicely into two classes. And so linear model can actually achieve that. But then um, here and here, they're not linear separable, which means there is no sort of simple line that would split this into two classes without sort of mixing them. And even worse situation is here. So for example, on this last picture, there's probably separating a line can be like this, it should be a curve and not a straight line, right? And so for example, linear model is not gonna work here. So depending on the data, um, you will need to have to use different types of models to achieve good classification. And um, you know there, may, there there exist many classification algorithms. A um, lot of the algorithm that we that we talked about on, uh, on the previous lecture about regression can also be used classification. Um, there was specifically classification algorithm which is called logistic regression, right? In, in spite of the fact that it's called regression, it's actually a classification algorithm. Um, decision trees um, we talked about them. You know, k nearest neighbors can be used for classification, um, bias type of algorithms, probabilistic algorithms, and of course, um, ensemble methods. Um, so things like, you know, random forest, again, we talked about it, or XG boost, gradient boosting decision trees. And of course, neural networks, um, we're not gonna touch on them, you know, we need lots and lots of data. So logistic regression, we, touched on, 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 on the idea of logistic regression a couple of lectures ago, just but just to remind you, um, it is quite straightforward. Let's say we have two classes and um, let's say we have, uh, um, you know, it, it, if what I'm showing here is a one dimensional problem. So, you know, this is your X variable, this is sort of your Y variable and we want to predict Y as a function of X. And uh, here, um, you know, we want to calculate, and this is important, the probability of uh, passing exam um, as a function of number of hours that the student studies. And of course, <clears throat> the training set is actually binary. Um, it's um, historically, it is known if somebody studied, for example, one hour, then it failed test, right? And somebody else studied, you know, half an hour and failed the test. Somebody studied five hours and it is, and uh, the person passed the test, right? And somebody studied four hours and passed the test. Somebody studied um, two hours, uh, well, two and a half hours passed the test or 1.8 to pass the test. Somebody studied two hours and failed. So these are data points, right? Um, they are discrete, so it is binary. It's either fail or pass. Um, they're given here. Um, and uh, within logistic regression, we try to map it with a logistic function. A logistic function is a function in the, in the form one divided by one plus um, exponent um, with some, well, yeah, that's terrible drawing. Well, it's, it's shown here, uh, one plus exponent with some coefficient. If it is one dimensional, then we're just taking, you know, this variables to coefficients. And uh, we, when we train the model, we're finding those coefficients, all right? And then, um, you know, this is the blue line is the line that our logistic regression 
um, the train logistic regression gives us as an answer. Now, if this is a probability and, and it predicts the probability of passing the test, now we can, for example, say, okay, we can either respond, uh, we can either return as, a, as an answer um, directly this probability saying like, look, you study four hours, there is your, you know, probably what 0 0.8, 0 0.8 probability, there's 0.8 probability to, to pass the test if you study four hours, right? Um, or if you study five hours, there is point, let's say 95 probability of stu study two hours, there is 0.25 probability to pass the test. Um, or we can actually, instead of that, we can say, okay, look, um, you know, if it's 50%, and we can say, okay, look, everything that is about 50%, probability we'll consider as we're going to pass the test and uh, anything uh, below 50 percent we will consider that you failed the test and so then for any data point we'll return binary answer and this approach is called thresholding and so when we have the model we can then set up a threshold and then based on that threshold um, return um, binary result so that's sort of the, 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 the easiest, the simplest sort of classical logistic regression model. Again, it's called regression, but it's a classification model, right? Because it solves the classification problem, um, binary classification the way it's here, or if it is, uh, so it's binary classification, right? And it can be from either, you know, one dimensional, the way it's shown here, or multi-dimensional. Okay. So the second, the second problem, um, the second approach, sorry, the second approach is a decision tree. It's pretty much um, the same trees as we discussed previously on a, on, a, on, um, on a lecture on regression, where um, you know the every node contains some information for making a decision. Um, and um, uh, the same way as previously, the internal nodes, they're, they're, they're decision nodes, and then the leaf nodes um, holds uh, numerical sort of or categorical, um, I'm, I'm sorry, and, and leaf node um, holds the outcome, sort of class of classification, right? And um, let's say, um, you know, on the right hand side, um, you see that within um, the internal decision nodes, you have, we have um, various parameters, right? So here's glucose entropy. Um, so I'm sorry, glucose less than something that the decision uh, value and then BMI, body mass index, um, and then there's age, right? And uh, um, based on those parameters, we can follow one of uh, the paths through the tree and end up um, in, the, in the leaf node. And then um, in the leaf node, um, it will be a class, right? So every leaf node will correspond to a particular um, class. And so if um, you trace, you know, on, and 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 any decision tree to the left is true, to the right is false for the condition that sits in the node, and then you eventually sort of arrive into one of the final leaves. And um, uh, what happens there? Um, some leaves will be so-called pure. So, for example, like here, there is, um, and let me highlight this. Um, like here, there are only say green nodes, and some leaves will have uh, more of, of mixed colors, or here mixed colors. And so that means we can also, in general, um, not only assign a class to a node, but have a probability of, an, of, of, of a leaf belonging to a particular class. For example, um, if, if your example, if your sample, when you classify, ends up in, in, in the bucket, um, if it ends up in this green bucket, it's probability equal to one, right? Because it's all green, 
probability equal to one for the for the green class. But if it ends up in this bucket, for example, the probability of yellow class is three fourth because it's three out of four samples. So, um, or if we don't do probabilities, but just say okay, uh, pure classification, then um, that node will be classified as yellow, and, and, and the very first one will be classified as green. So. Um, that's decision trees. Um, decision trees are actually, as always, good for understanding how you know algorithms work, um, and, and 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 quite explainable. But you know, in real life, uh, we try not to use decision trees or try to rarely use decision trees. Um, they are not very precise, and uh, um, you know, sometimes well. Often they are a fit to the data. Um, so the solution is instead of um, single decision tree, use forest of trees. And uh, we talked about this algorithm previously, a random forest, for example, where you actually set up multiple trees. Um, and the way it's done is by selecting subsets of data and training a tree um, on a subset of is training multiple trees, each on its own sub on overlapping subsets of data and on some subsets of features and getting different trees. And uh, then when we actually try to classify some node, um, I'm sorry, some new element, um, we send it through each of the tree and then each of the tree gives us an answer let's say it says the the node belongs the, the the data point belongs to class c and here class d class b class c and then we do voting which means you know just look for the agreement among the trees and here um you know trees make different decisions but two made decisions class c so it's majority voting um we as 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 a um, algorithm um random forest will give out here a class C. Then we can actually ask sort of the, the, the probability of the class C. And again, it can be estimated here that, you know, there are four trees, two of them agreed in class C. So it is um, one half probability is class C and 25 probability class D and 25 probability class B. Um, but again, this is sort of, this is a voting. That's probably the, the most stable and preferred um, method. Um, now, the same way as with, uh, as with uh, regression, uh, we, when we train models, we do uh, go into a split into the training data, test data, right? And the test data that we don't touch and we use it for final evaluation. And as we discussed last time, um, there is always sort of story of reducing a prediction error um, on the training on the training data and it will always be dropping and on the test data it will be first dropping but it will start growing and sort of the sweet spot in terms of model complexity is right here where um, you have the smallest possible um, error on the test um, data. Now, uh, what we haven't talked about previously is that within this training data, you can actually also do, you know, cross validation, you can split the data into segments like so called folds, and um, you can train on a different folds on the data on a subset of the data. And you do this in order to tune up parameters um, of the model. So what do I mean by that? So for example, if I want to build a tree, um, so I can I need to select um, the, the number, um, the depth of the tree, for example. Um, and this is a parameter that I need to give to an algorithm. And depending on the depth of the tree, it will be, you know, the, the, the bigger the depth, the more complex is the model. And so um, for each depth, I can train and uh, you know check the, the the quality of of 
uh, prediction on the training data and the test data, right? Then go for, for example, deeper tree. Or if I use random forest, it would be the depth of the trees and the number of trees. So all these parameters can be uh, calcul calculated, or you can try on the different parameters using this uh, multifold splitting within the training data. But again, the test data should remain untouched, and on the test data, you verify um, the eventual quality. Okay. Now, what? But there is a sort of an important difference in between um, classification and uh, regression, and this makes you know class classification a little bit more challenging problem. Um, in regression, when we calculated an error prediction error, it was typically was some sort of maximum, some, some sort of least square error where we wanted to predict some value. We had the value from the from from the you know, test set or from the train set, and then we compared the the difference. Um, you know, added up for all the data points, and that's pretty much was our error. Um, typically, in uh, in, uh, in in using um, least squares, but some of the squares, right? Um, it's not that straightforward when we do uh, classification. In classification, we actually have several options. Um, when you try to classify, let's, <coughs> let's say we do binary classification, um, we have so-called confused matrix. Um, we can have uh, what's called true positives. For example, we predict event and event happen, right? We can have true negatives. We, we predict that the event doesn't happen and nothing happens. We can have false positive, predict event and event doesn't happen, right? Or fail to predict um, and uh, the event happens. Uh, I'm talking here about events, but let's say we can talk about you know classes A and B. We can say um, you know predicted class A and it is class A. Uh, it's true positive. Predicted class B and it is class B. Um, that can be true negative. Predicted class A and it is class B. It is false positive. Predicted class B and it is class A. It is false negative. But traditionally, we talk about these positives and negatives in binary classification. And um, one of the simplest metrics is called accuracy. And accuracy is just the number of true predictions normalized by the total number of predictions. So there's true positives plus true negatives divided by the total number of predictions. Let's say you, know, you want to classify 100 items or 100 people, and um, you know, we predicted correctly that uh, uh, 50 say will will quit and, and and 20 will not quit um and and then we can call, say the accuracy is say you know 70 percent um unfortunately it's not that easy and i'll try to explain you on the next um example why just accuracy is not a good metric and by the way quite often when people talk about accuracy or accuracy of an algorithm, they really don't mean the, the definition of an accuracy, right? Because again, the definition of an accuracy is, is really not very useful by itself. Let me explain why and just give you a simple, simple example. Um, let's consider so-called majority class classifier. So majority class classifier is extremely simple classifier. It means whatever uh, data point, whatever sample you give it, it will always classify it as positive. All right. Again, it's a binary classification, positive, negative, but we'll have a dead simple classifier. Doesn't matter what features are, it will always re return positive result. Okay. It will always predict that's going to be positive. Now, imagine that we have a data set. And uh, the data set, let's say 100 people, 
And again, we're trying to predict that, uh, let's say, you know, it's 100 customers and we're trying to predict um, whether they're going to churn or not. And we know that within the data set, um, the baseline is such that there are 50 positive and 50 negative, right? So if we um, take this brute force classifier, which calls everything positive, and then uh, it predicts for each and every data point here, each and every data point of 100 data points, the answer is positive. Well, uh, obviously it means, you know, 50% will be correct for half of this and 50% will be wrong. And so if I, if I calculate accuracy, accuracy will be, you know, 50 divided by 100, so 0.5. All right, fine. Then I take exactly the same classifier and apply it to slightly different data set. Let's say we have a data set that consists of 90% positive examples and 10% negative examples. Then if I predict that everything is positive, right, then um, I will be right in 90% of the cases and wrong in 10% of the cases. In this case, accuracy will be 90% which is very strange, right? It's exactly the same algorithm, but on a different data sets and the only difference between those two data sets is the ratio of the number of positives and negative examples. It actually shows very different accuracy. In fact, the life is even worse because it really means that if somebody comes and tells you, hey, look, I have an algorithm with 80% accuracy, you cannot even tell if it's a good algorithm or bad algorithm, because if it achieved that accuracy on uh, you know, this data set, it's a good algorithm. But if it achieved that accuracy on this data set, that's terrible because um, you know, just dumb calling everything positive gives us higher accuracy overall. So accuracy is not a good metric. So what would be the good metric? Well, the good metric would be actually measuring not absolute numbers, but relative. And um, one of those approaches, and you know, sort of the most widespread, is measuring what's called uh, true and false positive rates. So instead of actually just counting, calculating uh, how many positives, true positives, and, and true negatives there, we calculate the ratio of true positives over total positives and false positives over false positives over the negatives. So if we try to use that metric right here, we'll see that um, on, on this data set, um, true positives, which is we're gonna call positives positives, they're 50, uh, and overall positives are 50. So true positive rate is one, which means really any positive is correctly identified. And false positives, um, if we take uh, here, um, there are really 50 false positives and, and overall there are 50 negative examples. So pretty much every false positive that's possible we, we, we made. So false positive rate is also one, which means you know picked up all the false positive results. Um, but if we take a different data set, the one we looked here with 90% uh, and 10%, again, it's 90% divided by 90. It's true positive rates uh, 90 and false positive rate one. So if we measure it not by the metric accuracy, but by the relative metrics, which is called true positive rates and false positive rate, uh, then uh, it makes sense. And this is absolute metrics for algorithm. And it doesn't matter what data set you use, you know, it stays. So if the algorithm performs with TPR1 and FPR1, then uh, it does it on all um, data sets. And that's characteristic of pure algorithm and not an algorithm on data. You can also think about this sort of accuracy, you know, this formula um, as, as 
it, it shows not only the quality of an algorithm, but it shows sort of how well algorithm works on a particular data set, right? Uh, with a particular balance. And what I just described is called balance of the classes. Here, it's the balanced situation because we have, you know, the same number of examples of each class. Here, it's unbalanced. And, but in fact, most of the interesting problems in, in, in that we meet in, in business, they are unbalanced. Now, for example, we want to predict the churn. Well, the churn is really usually like say 1% in, the, in, in, in real life, maybe 3%, maybe 10%, but it is ratio 10 to one, those who are gonna churn versus not gonna churn. So it's quite unbalanced. Um, and in this type of modeling, um, sort of simply call everybody that's gonna stay is not going to help because yeah it is true you know the model will will show you 90 percent accuracy but uh there, there is no point in this model because you really want to try to detect those who's going to leave and if you want to detect those who are going to click on the ad that's one out of you know ten thousand people or or, or hundred thousand people so it's even more unbalanced so um you need to get used to work with quite unbalanced um, data. Okay, so uh, this is a confusion matrix on the left hand side, right? The true positives, false positives, false negatives, true negatives. And what I'm saying is, in order to characterize algorithms, you need to go one step further. And instead of just using this true positives, false positives, uh, uh, false positives, true negatives, false negatives, you know, absolute numbers, you need to use rates where um, we normalize um, by the formulas. So true positive rate is true positive divided by positive, false positive rate, false positive divided by negative. And there is also corresponding false negative and true negative rates. Uh, typically, it's enough for us since there is this numbers are all kind of interconnected. It's enough to consider true positive rates and false positive rates. And that's what's usually done um, traditionally when you build models. Um, moreover, it is very convenient to use to evaluate classifier on the scale on, on this two dimensional plot um, where we show false positives rates and true positive rate. So again, uh, instance positive, prediction positive, true positive rate, um, instance negative, prediction positive, false positive rate. Let me give you a few examples. So first of all, the perfection, the perfect situation is no false positives and 100% true positives. So, which means um, whenever we predict something, uh, it really happens. And uh, uh, whenever we predict something that doesn't happen. Um, and classifiers, you can put this depending on those rates, you can put it sort of anywhere on this uh, plot. Um, What's interesting that let's imagine that you want to uh, build a you know, fire alarm, right? So what would this be? True positive rate means the fire alarm went off and there is a really fire. False positive, it's a false alarm. It is uh, when you know, there is no fire, but alarm went went off and, and got firefighters coming. So what you really, I mean, again, you, you know, the, 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 in the perfect world, you want to be here. True positive rate is one, false positive rate is zero. But that rarely happens. So, you know, with fire alarm, you want to have, you want to be somewhere, you know, close to the top, right? Because you want, you don't want to miss any fires, but you're okay with some false alarms, but not very many, right? The, th the same thing you can think of, you know, your car alarm, right? So, you know, you, you want you wanted to detect if somebody is going to really steal you, if somebody will be stealing your car, but 
At the same time, you do want to sleep at night, so you don't want color, car, car alarm going off um, constantly. At the same time, at the same time, so so you know the fire, sort of the fire alarm, you want it to be there, right, somewhere. But let's say you know you're you're doing another algorithm, which say face recognition or, or some other algorithm that that you know opens a door into a secure location, right? Um, in this case, um, if I mean again, you know, in the perfect world, you want to be in, in this corner. <clears throat> uh, there is no perfect world, so true positive means this is uh, sort of the right face that has access to that has that that whose access you know who has allowed access, and so you can you know let it come in. Uh, false positive means you would you would provide access to somebody who is not eligible who is not allowed so this is bad so in in this case you're okay to reduce um you know to reduce somehow true positive rate so for example not letting somebody who has access to come in but definitely try to prevent situation when somebody um who, who is a stranger um that the lock will work for him so again no perfect world your algorithms um, will always be some balance in between sort of mistakes it makes and um, you know the the the, the results it, it achieves. Um, and as a uh, you know data scientist, your job would be to really sort of select the algorithm and tune it up such a way that will provide the optimal true positive rate and false positive rate depending on the problem you're trying to solve. Now, um, what's interesting is that we can actually, with the same classifier, we can control this ratio um, by selecting the right threshold. Um, the same way as in your car alarm, you can sort of twist sensitivity. And, and so idea is the following, and this is um, called usually a ranking classifier. And the idea comes from, uh, you know, the, the logistic regression, right, where for every prediction, there is a probability, right? There is a probability for that, for that prediction. You know, you take out the data point, there is a probability. You take another point, and there is a probability. So it's not binary, there are numbers. So probability, um, and, and so for here, for, for the uh, logistic regression, it's a probability. For, say, for the trees, it's not necessarily going to be a probability, but, but can be some sort of score. So the model will give you a score. And the score, the higher the score, um, the more chances that the that the the point that you want to classify will belong to the positive class. And so the idea is the following: we can actually sort all the samples that you're classifying by the score, right? The way it's shown here, from 099, 098, etc. And then you can actually select the level of a threshold, threshold level. For example, if I select here on probability this as a threshold, then you know every point to the right from, from this line will be classified as positive, and everything to the left will be classified as negative. But if I select here a threshold in between positive and negatives, then everything here you know, will be classified as positives and everything to the left will be classified as negatives and so on. So depending on the threshold I select, uh, I'll have different classifications. Some points will be classified positive or negatives. And so um, here, if I assign a score to every point, then uh, based on a threshold, I would have more points classified as positive or negative. For example, let's say, um, and, and here are the true values, 
right? Positive negative class. And let's say I pick a threshold, which is very high. Then according to the threshold, I will have, um, you know, zero uh, positives, right? And everything will be classified as negatives. Um, now, if I go a little bit lower, well, there will be a sort of one true positive, it is positive. And so uh, it is one true positive. If I go a little bit lower threshold, I'll have two positives. I lower the threshold even more. Well, look, there are actually two positives, one negatives, uh, one negative. So, you know, there is still true positive. But since everything about the threshold is considered by our, by our classifier as positive, this guy, we mistakenly will call also positive. And so um, it becomes false, uh, false positive, and here it is, right? It's this one, and so on. And so depending on where we choose threshold, we'll get different confusion matrix, different values in the confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix, in the sense, it's not an absolute. It really depends on the threshold level you select for a model. And that threshold is a parameter you can choose. And um, depending on that parameter, and here again, we can actually recalculate the true positive rate uh, for the false positive rate and uh, the true positive rate, and we can plot it on the graph. And so what happens, um, Again, this is the same, literally the same, uh, the, the same table is just sort of flipped upside down. If I choose threshold here, um, I'll get zeros and zeros. And remember, we calculate false positive rates and true positive rates. It's here. But let's say if I choose threshold right there, um, there are eight positive examples. That are true positives, and let's calculate them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So there are eight positive examples, which are true positives, and there are four negatives. Four negatives, that's what's in here. Then we can recalculate from this table, um, we can recalculate rates uh, for positive, I'm sorry, eight positive examples out of. 100 positives. So it's going to be uh, true positive rate 0, 0, 008. It's y axis. And negative is 4 out of 100. So 0, 0, 004. This is x axis. And so this is a data point, right? And if we do this by sliding the threshold, right, we'll get for each position of the threshold, we'll get confusion matrix. And we'll get a um, certain value of true positive rate and false positive rate. And then we can plot it on this uh, TPR, FPR plot. And you know, we'll get those data points. And so each of those data points means uh, corresponds to a, uh, a particular regime, particular sensitivity of your classifier. Right. So if we select the threshold to be, you know, at, at this level, right? So to be, where is it 0.4? So threshold to be at this level, here it is. Um, true positive rate will be 0.4, false positive rate will be uh, 0.15, and that's the performance of our classifier. But exactly with the same model, exactly with the same classifier, we can put a different threshold level and then um, the classifier will be formed differently, will be more, for example, will give you more true positives, right? We'll capture better positives, will capture better fires, but will also give you more false alarms. Now, in the perfect world, you would be here, you'll you're never there, so you always be along this sort of some, some curve. Um, and um, um, if we look at this picture, um, that's sort of the, that's what the typical curve looks like. 
Um, the curve has a name, which is called uh, ROC curve um, or receiver operating curve. Um, that goes back to like World War II um, examples and the way radars um, were operating. But the point here is if you take a classifier and want to measure its quality, the classifier can operate in any regime. It can operate um, sort of with this level of true positive and false positive. It can operate at this level with true positive and false positive. It can operate with this level true positive and false positives. It's exactly the same classifier, exactly the same model. It's just the level of the threshold that you're shifting. And uh, you can, as a data scientist, select um, the position, select the data point on this curve where you believe your classifier will do the best for the business, right? Again, it can give you, you know, 40% um, on, on true positives and 10% of false positives, or it can give you 90% on true positives, um, you know, catch up pretty much all of the fires, but, you know, will give you 50% um, on, on, on negatives. Um, the same actually problem, the same sort of way you can estimate, uh, you know, sensitivity specificity of the tests, whether you do like PCR tests, it's very sensitive, sensitive but can also provide some um, false positives. So you no, know, no COVID, but the test will come positive. So this curve called ROC curve, and since um, you know, it's what's important is the shape of the curve. In fact, um, it has been shown that the real importance is the area under the curve. So, you know, this area under the curve, well, I can actually, we can cover it all, it doesn't really matter. Um, so the area under the curve, that's what's really important. And so the further the curve, the closer the curve to the boundaries, um, let me switch to a different color, the better it is, right? If you get those type of curves, these are better classifiers. And the classifier along the horizontal, along the diagonal is actually a random curve. It's, it's, it's a bad classifier. So when you want to, to measure the quality of the classifier, you draw this ROC curve. Well, and again, the good news, you don't really need to do it yourself. There is there is, there is an algorithm in, in, in Python that will calculate this. It will tell you um, the, uh, it will give you the, the curve and it will calculate you the area under the curve. An area under the curve is this one. Well, you could, sometimes you can, people talk about this whole thing, right? The area under the curve. Um, and, um, Imagine again, if your classifier is perfect, which is it kind, kind of this way, right? Sort of straight up and straight horizontal, then the area and the curve would be one, right? This area is one and that's a perfect world. Um, the diagonal line is, is, is a bad line. It's a random classifier. So just flipping a coin. And so the area and the curve is 0.5. So you know your, your your real life will be somewhere in between 0.5 and one. And you know here's an example 0.79. So this is a metric how you measure the the, the the quality of the classifier, not just by the accuracy and very by, by the accuracy by that formula. And very often when people talk about how accurate the classifier is, they actually give you this area under the curve number, um, AUK, RC AUK number, um, and that tells you for real independently on, independent on um, your data set, uh, how well your classifier operates, right? Um, it will operate that way independently on the data set. And of course, the, the closer this rock AUK to um, one, the better is your classifier. And then you as a data scientist need to select some point on this curve where you actually will operate, right? You will choose the threshold that will set up, that will select a particular sort of level of sensitivity for your classifier. But the ratio of the sensitivity and specificity or the number of true positives and number of false positive rates is given to you um, by this curve. 
Now, I know uh, when you first, if you, if you never heard about this before, you know, that's quite confusing. It will take some time to go over this and, you know, try yourself. Then you start getting some sort of um, capturing some, some sense out of those curves. Now, these curves, they're mostly used by, you know, data scientists, statisticians, um, engineers. They're rarely used by business people. Business people use different type of curves, but they can also um, be obtained from um, um, the, the from the modeling approach and from the ranking classif classifiers as we discussed them. Again, these ROC things, this is something for you as a data scientist and engineers to talk among your you know among your peers um, regarding sort of the quality of the classifier. Now, in business, people talk about usually uh, what's called cumulative response of classifiers or lift curves. So the idea is uh, you know, quite similar um, where I took exactly the same table, right? Where we have a, um, you know, the scores. And then um, what we measure on the sort of vertical axis here, it's a percentage of, of uh, positive targeted, so which is TPR rate, true positive over positive, right? And on, but on the X axis, instead of false positive rates, we, we take all the, um, all the test instances, right? Um, by score, which is a percentile, right? There's 100%, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%. So it just counts how many points um, we go. So if I take this line, how many positives we got? If I take this line, and here we call positives, how many positives we got? If I take this line, how many positives we have, right? And if I take all 100% of the data points, of course, it will capture all the positives. Now, why is this um, important? Well, because remember, what we want to do is we want to, for example, select the customers, those who are more likely to churn. So we want to rank them by the probability of a churn. And then um, if I take you know, the first, and let's say I rank them, and then I split it into buckets. And if I want to take, I, I will take the first bucket, um, I want to make sure that the number of customers that are going to churn will be very high in this first bucket, right? And slowly decrease, um, the probability will decrease. And that is usually shown by what's called a uh, lift curve, which compares you the probability of a churn uh, or probability of, of whatever, right? The likelihood of something within those percentile of the data. Now, let me give you a sort of some numerical example, um, and, and hopefully it will be easier to understand with numbers. Let's say we took our customers and we calculated um, the likelihood for the churn, and we sorted all the customers by that likelihood, such a way that um, the customers here uh, have the highest likelihood, right? This will be the highest likelihood to churn, and then the likelihood will drop, right? So this is high, um, this is low. And then we split all the customers into 10 buckets, 10 deciles, you know, so there is uh, customers in the first decile, second, third. So there are overall 25,000 customers or cases, and we split them by 2,500 each. Okay. All right. Actually, 2,500, right? So if, remember, we rank, we sorted the customers by the likelihood of a churn, right? The probability of a churn, the probability of response. 
Then if we did a good job, if the model did a good job, that the number of responses in the first decile in the first bucket will be greater than in the second, greater than the third, fourth, etc. And that's what we see here. This is the total number of responses. Now, if, if we did not sort the customers, and we know that overall there will be 48, uh, you know, 74 responses. Um, divided by the total number of cases, you know, 25,000. Then in every bucket, where we have twenty five hundred cases, we'll have four hundred eighty seven responses on average. Okay. So if we just mixed and randomly distributed customers among the buckets, in every bucket, there will be 487 responses. But since we rank the customers by the likelihood of response, and response can be shown here, then we got, we got many more responses in the first bucket, less in the second, less in the third, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so the gain chart shows us um, how many additional responses, how many responses cumulatively we, we get when we take our buckets. And uh, if we uh, did not, if we just randomly assign customers to buckets and we picked up 10% of the customers, we will got on average 10% of responses. Yeah, we got 30% of the customers, we'll get 30% of responses. We got 60% of the customers, we got 60% responses. But since we did this sorting or ranking, then in the first bucket, 10% of the customers, we're getting 45 or what is it? 44, 71% of responses. And you know, when we pick up second bucket, the efficiency drops a little bit, but for 20%, we got 80% responses. We pick up three buckets, we got 90% responses. And then there's diminishing returns. So if you're a business person um, and you're kind of happy with the 80 20 thing, you know, you'll need to take this 20%, get 80% response, and then not touch sort of anybody else um, in your marketing campaign, right? Um, but this is sort of you know rule of thumb, right? I just said, okay, well, look, this is where the sharp curve, um, and then when it, we get the diminishing returns, you probably should just leave it alone. Now, you can show it in the gain chart, or you can show it in the lift chart. Lift chart is just tells you it's comparing to your uh, baseline performance. So if baseline performance is 487 baseline response, and we got in the first bucket. 2,179 response, then 2,179 divided by 4,87 will give us um, four times, 4.47 times lift. So lift is literally tells me how many times more we got response compared to um, the baseline, right? And it's a cumulative lift chart. So, you know, it, it shows you overall, if we take again, 10% um, of the data um, that we, they will get response four times more, 4.5 times more than if we just randomly picked up 10% of the people. If we get 20% of the people, we got response four times more than if we uh, selected, if we, if we uh, you know, took random uh, 20%, right? If we get 40%, we'll get 2.5 higher response um, within that group than um, if we randomly select it. And if we get everybody, well, then of course the response will be the same as well, we got everybody, right? So it's just the base rate. So these are the charts that business people do understand. But in order to build this chart, well, there are two ways, right? One is to actually you know, run the campaign um, and uh, measure things, and then you, you, you will get this chart, right? 
Um, or uh, you build a predictive model, and then from the predictive model, from you know, false positive, true positive rates, you can actually predict um, these charts, right? Okay. Um, having said that, there is still one sort of question that remains is um, whether you look at, um, you know, at, at our sort of classifiers um, where you want, you, you know, the, the classifier you built, um, whether you want it to work sort of here or at this false positive rates or this level or at this level, or, you know, similar question. Um, if you look at the you know lift the gain chart, well, do you want to actually um, go for you know twenty percent, or you want to go for forty percent? Because again, you know twenty percent it's high efficiency, uh, but forty percent yes, the efficiency is a bit lower, but um, the coverage is much larger. It's forty percent of people, right, instead of twenty. So you know the, there is a, there is always a question here. Um, and um, one of the ways to approach this is through computing, um, uh, you know, the, the, the business sort of parameters it's called costs, well, cost sensitive modeling. Um, before we go there, just a quick, very, very quick um, uh, sort of idea for, for churn model, since, you know, we, at home, I think you're going to be doing the homework on churn. Um, the idea is, you know, you have some customers, right? And uh, your model as a churn model need to predict which of the customers is going to leave the service. And then the idea would be, the business idea would be that, you know, if you can predict that somebody is going to leave um, your service, you can provide an additional discount for that person, right? To keep them at the service. Of course, discount should be less than, you know, how much money you made out of this person. But uh, or how much money you expect to make out of him, but uh, you know there should be some discount. At the same time, and and this discount should be in sort of enough to motivate the person to stay with your service. At the same time, um, giving a discount to somebody who is not going to leave well doesn't make sense, right? Why would you want to give a discount to this person? It's just a waste of money. Um, or not giving a discount to somebody who will leave, well, that will cost you in the sense that, well, the person will go away and, and, and you lose your, 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 your revenue from, from this guy. And, and by the way, this also tells you that, you know, if you want to make money on, 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 as, as a client of mobile companies, once in a while, you need to behave such a way that, um, that shows that you're planning to leave, and then they will come up to you with discounts. But anyway, so among all the customers, we can actually look at the what's you know here true positive means. Well, it's those guys who are planning to churn for real, right? And the model predicts they're going to churn, so it's true positives. False positives, it's non-churners, so the model predicts that they're going to churn, but actually they're not going to churn. So it's false positive. The model says it's going to churn, but they in reality they're not churning. And then there is a predicted non-churners. False negative means the model made a mistake. And uh, it says that the person is not going to churn, but the customer is not going to churn, but the customer will churn. Well, and then there is actual non-churners. You, you know, the model predicts that the customer is not going to churn and the customer is not going to churn. And based on that, we can actually try to calculate um, the expected profit, right? Because we can, you know, assign values to each of this event, uh, to the event that that we're going to lose the customer, to the event that we're going to correctly predict that's going to churn, and then we can actually calculate expected profit, and based on that expected profit, and our calculations, we can select the optimal parameter for our model, the optimal point at which to run our model. Here's a sample example. Um, let's say, you know, on the left-hand side here, um, this, this, oh, oops. Um, 
here we have a, a plot for our ROC curve. Let's say this is our model. And then the vertical red line, this is a parameter. This is, let's say, we selected to operate right here at this true positive and false positive rate. Let's say at this point, our confusion matrix in terms of false positive, true positive rates will, be, will look like this. You know, the, 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 the true positive rate will be 92.92, the, 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 um, the false negative rate um, point, um, to, I'm sorry, true negative rate will be 0.86, uh, et etc. et cetera. Then we can also create a cost matrix. A cost matrix will tell us that if somebody is going to churn and we predict that he's going to churn correctly, then um, it will make us $90. I assume that this is how much it costs us, uh, how much money we can make um, on the customer minus how much it costs us to advertise to him, discount. And let's say here, this is, we predicted that the customer um, is, is going to churn, but in fact, it's not churner. So that means we actually lost some money because uh, we gave discount, but we didn't have to give discount. You know, the person wouldn't churn anyway. And so we lost on this. So then we can actually calculate and estimate um, the values and we can calculate, we can have this profit and we can draw this profit curve as uh, you know, percentile of, for example, you know, test instances, right? So the the percent on the customers, and for different models, right? The classifier one, classifier two, classifier three, and you can see that look, you know, depending on um, you know how and where we select threshold, we can actually get to the point of sort of maximum profit, where we select this value, or for example. You know, if we choose say eight percent, um, then out of those classifiers, there's this one that works the best, right? At eight percent, for example, there's one big classifier that works the best. Uh, but overall classifiers, there is a the best maximum profit for the company will be, you know, this classifier approximately what forty five or fifty percent. So um, the the bottom line here is the following: we can calculate um, numerically um, the, the we can evaluate on the test set the quality of the model right and numerical quality of the model is given by the values of true positive rate and false positive rate and by ROC curve and area under the curve but those metrics are good for data scientists and engineers to talk with the business guys you need to recalculate those recalibrate those in the um, in, 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 in the value um, recal recalibrated in the, say, lift curves or um, uh, gain charts, right? And if there is an opportunity, then, um, you know, if you can calculate or assume this cost matrix, um, then you can actually build this type of uh, sort of profits of classifiers. And then um, that will determine, that will allow you to determine the optimal point for a classifier um, and where to use it. Um, so for all these models, again, ROC curves and um, false positive, true positive rates, these are sort of technical values. Eventually you need to take and understand from the business perspective um, if it's a more of a fire alarm situation and sort of what uh, if you can tolerate higher true positive rates versus um, higher false positive rates and, and sort of what the optimal combination is it uh, uh, for, for your particular business. All right, on this, I think we're out of time and um, we are done for today. I strongly recommend you guys go and look at the book, um, Data Science for Business. Um, there is a chapter there with this example. Um, so read carefully. Um, 
how to adjust how do you adjust classifiers as i said with a classifier you go you adjust the threshold in the classifier right you build the classifier you train it and then you adjust the threshold uh, you select the point at which the classifier is going to operate so um, the, there were questions where to look for this churn examples uh, go for uh, look for the book the one I mentioned, you know, data science for business, it actually talks about the churn modeling and talks about this cost sensitive learning an example. And um, I think I'll try to find out um, this, this picture is from one of the, you know, research papers, um, or you can Google for, you know, churn model prediction. Um, there are some research papers um, out there uh, where people go into the details how they build their churn models. Okay. So, and with that, we're done for today. Um, and you will have a seminar starting in a couple of minutes. And it's also going to be on a, a different link, on a new uh, Zoom link. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. And Thank you for the lecture. Bye. Uh -huh.